Thank you. That's so nice. Thank you so much. Um, and I, I apologise so much for keeping you waiting. Thanks for, um, thanks for waiting for me. I had no idea of the traffic on Connecticut Avenue. Um, so let's go straight to Jerusalem. Um, I've been going to Jerusalem all my life, ever since I was a little, little boy, ever since I was a baby. And ever since I've been a writer, I've wanted to write basically this book that I've now written. And I've been thinking of a way to, to write about Jerusalem. The trouble with Jerusalem is, as you know, there are millions of books about Jerusalem. Virtually all of them are about, this, about the Israel-Palestine conflict, King David, the Crusades, or Jesus. And there's nothing, there's very few books. There's, there's only one book in print, in fact, in English, that is a sort of, his, is a parallel history to this, which is Karen Armstrong's book, which many of you may have seen. And that's really a theological book. It's a wonderful book, but it's really about the nature of God in Jerusalem. Now, I wanted to read a book that was really about not just the architecture, not just the holiness, the theology, not just one empire after another conquering it, but the people that made Jerusalem and, and how they built it and how, and how it developed. Because after all, it's people, it's families that build cities. And Jerusalem is a city that's both evolved and um, been created by great dramatic acts of slaughter and destruction as well. And it's a combination of these two things. And I wanted to catch that. And so I looked for this book for a long time, and I couldn't find it. And I read other books about Russia. And then um, once I read about Benjamin Disraeli, who's rather a hero of mine, and a person who visited Jerusalem, and he's in, he's in the book. And he said, when I want to read a book, I write it. And, um, and so humbly following in Dizzy's footsteps, um, I've, I've slightly done the same thing here. Sorry, yeah, is that, is, that, is that malfunctioning? Nope, not anymore, thank you. Good. Okay. Thank Thanks. You. So, so I said about writing this book, why is it called Jerusalem The Biography? Um, well, first of all, those of you, in, uh, who, and probably many of you know, that in the Jewish scriptures, in the Torah and the Talmud, Jerusalem is always described as a woman. Sometimes a, f a mistress abandoned by her lovers, sometimes a beautiful princess in scarlet silks, but always a woman. So that's one reason. Jerusalem as a personality is, a, is an idea that I liked and appealed to me, and it suits the place. But also, I said this is about the people. And what I, what I wanted to do was, was create, a, um, create a book that would, would, inc would, would confront very complicated ideas. After all, the names alone are incredibly complicated. There are, Babylon there are Babylonian names, there are Turkish names, there are English names, there are Hebrew names or Arabic names and so on. And so many civilizations, Assyrians, Ottomans, Mamluks and so, so forth. So the book had to be readable by someone who really knew nothing about the Middle East, nothing about Jerusalem and didn't read history books. My, namely my mother. <laughs> and... Um, and so, um, and so that's why I designed it, so that it's in very small sections, and each section is a person. And it's a person who helped make the city in some way or other. And, and basically, the great thing about being the writer is it's, they're the people that interested me and that I loved and I wanted to write about. And so it's a biography, it's a collection of biographies as well. Now, some of them you, you may, are sort of obscure characters you may scarcely have heard of, like Jesus Christ or Herod the Great, or David Ben-Gurion. And other of them are well-known characters um, like Evlia, the, the Ottoman travel writer, or Osama bin Munkid, the, um, the, the Arab, um, the Arab um, knight and writer during the time of the Crusades. And some of these people are people that I discovered. I hadn't heard of them before, and I'm, I'm sure many of you hadn't either. But it's, it's partly a literary book. And partly I just wanted to share with you the joy of reading about Jerusalem and discovering these people. And maybe, um, maybe you'll go off and read more. If you read the book, you'll go off and read more books about Jerusalem or read the, go back to the primary source if it catches your imagination. Um, so that's, that's why I wrote this book. That's, that's what I decided to do. Now, the great challenge of Jerusalem, of course, is that um, it's, it's, it's both the blessing and the curse of Jerusalem that everybody feels that Jerusalem is partly owned by them. Um, everybody has a vision of Jerusalem, even though um, you may be a secular person, an atheist, a person who despises religion, you will still have a view of what Jerusalem should be. And of course, if you're a religious person, you have a very strong view of what Jerusalem should be. 
And that's why, at the moment, it's a, it's a fascinating time in history, because even though from Washington, D.C. to London to Paris, many of us look upon religious people with a slightly mocking smile. Um, we think that, you know, we, you know we, we portray them often in the media as a sort of borderline mad. Um, in fact, in America, in the Middle East, in, in Jerusalem, all over the world, you know, obviously fundamentalist people, by which I mean people who, who believe the Bible is, a fundament, is fundamentally the divine word of God, or the Quran, um, those people are increasing in numbers within the three great Abrahamic faiths. And in Jerusalem, and I, I don't, I'm sure many of you have been there recently, you feel this strongly now. Um, you feel it strongly that, you know, that the number of um, Muslims, Palestinians, for example, who are now extremely observant has increased enormously since I started going to Jerusalem as a child. And you know, you, when you walk through the streets of Jerusalem, you often, it, the call to prayer, now you see people um, you know, go, going down and, and, and praying in a way that you would never have seen 40 years ago. Of course, for Jews, um, there are far more Haredi Jews now in Jerusalem, Orthodox Jews. And of course, Christians in America, you know about evangelism more than, more than we do in England. So you need no explanation. For all these three groups of people, Jerusalem is the place, as it was for the Muhammad, as it was for Jesus, is the place where when the kingdom of heaven comes, Judgment Day, the Apocalypse, the Second Coming, the coming of the Messiah, the coming of the Mahdi, whatever you want to call it, it will happen in Jerusalem. It can only happen in Jerusalem. It will happen somewhere outside the Golden Gate. Golden Gate, beautiful, mystical, mysterious structure. Um, actually, my favorite structure in the whole of Jerusalem. Um, and that's where it's going to happen according to all those, those, those three faiths. We're very different, we're very different scenarios, incidentally, but basically that's, that's, what's, that's where it's going to happen. So for them, for ever-increasing numbers of these people, ever, ever more politicized, as you know, in Israel, but also in, in, the, in the Muslim world, also in Iran and elsewhere, um, Israel is ever more the center of the world. Now, you know that in... in um, Byzantine times, up to Crusader times, and into the early Middle Ages, into the Middle Ages, um, really up to the Reformation, you often saw maps in which Jerusalem was literally the center of the world. And there was a, you've seen those maps. There was one in the book. There was a cross over the world, and it, the, 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 cross, the center of the cross was Jerusalem, and the center of the, the cross in Jerusalem was the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And so... In those days, people literally believed that Jerusalem was the physical center of the world. And again now today, in a weird sort of way, in a weird 21st sort of way, Jerusalem is again one of the centers of the world. I've talked about the fundamentalist belief in the, in, in, in the apocalypse and judgment day. But also, geopolitically, you know, in the Middle East, it's the fulcrum of all, it's in the crosshairs of all the great um, crises, all the great conflicts of today. Um, secularism versus fundamentalism, not just um, between the Western world and, say, the Muslim world, but also within Judaism, for example. I mean, it, we're in a strange situation now where, you know, the, 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 Her the Haredim, the, the Orthodox Jews, often stone non-observing non Jews on the Sabbath, for example, in Jerusalem. So within the religions themselves, there is ever-growing ever conflict. Um, Jerusalem is at the center, of course, of the Israel-Palestine um, conflict, and that in itself has a sort of iconic value, an iconic centrality in many of the, many of the crises that are happening in the Arab-Muslim world, um, and in and it's, it's an ever, great, ever greater importance in Europe, too, and in America. So all of these things are really being played out um, in Jerusalem in different, in different ways. And, and also, you know, America versus Iran. Iran has very shrewdly taken up the cause of Jerusalem. They have a Jerusalem Day. Um, the elite, the elite um, part of the, the Revolutionary Guard is called the Al Quds Brigade. You know, the Al Quds Brigade. In so, in so many ways, they have cleverly taken up Jerusalem as a way. They are Persians. They are Aryans. Um, they are Shia, and they are appealing to the Sunni um, Arabs, who are often suspicious of them. And so using Jerusalem is a very clever way of doing this. So for so many different ways, Jerusalem is ever more central. And it's one of the sadnesses of Jerusalem in a sense that 
you know, this piles on the intensity um, of all the world's troubles.